Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Seth Harris. I'm the Deputy Secretary of Labor. Mr. Vice President, let me begin by thanking you for your outstanding leadership in the Middle Class Task Force. Secretary Solis and her staff at the Labor Department are proud of our contributions to this essential work of expanding and strengthening America's middle class. Retirement security is fundamental to that effort. Along with Social Security and personal savings, workers need secure pensions if they're to remain in the middle class when their working days are done. A secure pension system is also essential to the long-term health of our economy, whether it's in 401ks, private sector defined pension plans, individual retirement accounts, or public sector pension plans, workers' pension monies create tremendous pools of investment capital that create jobs and expand our economy. But pension money must be invested wisely if it's going to serve both of these purpose purposes, that is, retirees who have middle class incomes and continuing job creation and economic growth. Mr. Vice President, at the Labor Department, we think workers will make good decisions about their pensions if they get good information. So today, in partnership with the Middle Class Task Force, I'm delighted to announce the publication of two new rules that will strengthen America's pension system by assuring that workers get the good information they need. The first rule would make certain that workers get unbiased advice about how to invest the money in their IRAs and 401ks. Workers manage these pensions themselves, so expert advice can be helpful, but that advice must be unbiased. And there must be no risk that the advisor will benefit from steering workers to particular benefit, to particular investments. If this rule is finally adopted, investment advisors wouldn't be able to make extra money if workers choose, to, choose an investment in which the advisor has a financial interest. So we'll avoid conflicts of interest. Investment advisors would also be required to disclose their fees, and computer models used to offer investment advice would have to be certified as objective and unbiased. We project that 2 million workers in defined contribution pension plans and 13 million IRA holders would benefit from this rule to the tune of $6 billion. But it's a proposed rule, so we invite everyone to go to the Labor Department's website to learn more and offer their views. The second rule will increase transparency at multi-employer plans, that is, pension plans collectively bargained by unions and groups of employers. There are 13 and one half million workers enrolled in multi-employer plans. This rule will require that if any of these workers or their unions ask for information about the health of the plans, the plan administrator must provide that information. Very simply, this rule assures that workers and their unions can monitor the financial condition and the day-to-day -day operations of their retirement investments. Mr. Vice President, I know regulations aren't the sexiest topic of conversation. <laughs> and Secretary Solis and I don't have any illusions about the difficulties facing America's workers, particularly in the midst of these tough economic times. It'll take time, hard work, and perseverance for workers to rebuild their retirement savings. But the two rules the Middle Class Task Force and the Labor Department are announcing today will make a real difference in the lives of working and retired Americans. And that's why the President created the Middle Class Task Force and asked v Vice President Biden to chair it. The Labor Department stands ready, Mr. Vice President, to continue our work with you, the Middle Class Task Force, and the President to strengthen and expand our middle class and to assure retirement security for all. We look forward to the challenge. And now I'm delighted to introduce Peter Orzag, the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. Thank you, Seth, and thank you all for being here today. The Middle Class Task Force was formed a little more than a year ago at the height of the most severe economic recession our economy has experienced since the Great Depression. A year ago, real GDP was falling at the fastest rate in a quarter century. We were losing an average of 700,000 jobs each month, equivalent to the entire population of the state of Vermont. The capital and credit markets were virtually frozen. Economists of all stripes feared that our economy would sink into a depression. That didn't happen, in no small part because the administration acted quickly and strongly to get lending flowing again, stabilize the housing market, and jumpstart economic activity by passing the Recovery Act. 
The Recovery Act is working. It's a key reason that we have moved from the economy falling by almost 6% at the end of 2008 to increasing by almost 6% at the end of 2009. It's funding critical infrastructure projects all across the nation. And let me note this, it's doing so in a way that is not only transparent, but at least thus far, with a remarkable lack of fraud and abuse. And I would attribute that in no small part to the efforts from our Vice President, Sheriff Joe, <laughs> in making sure that mayors, governors, and others are treating this seriously and doing so in a responsible manner. There's much more work to be done to bolster the jobs market and much still more work to be done to reverse the declines that middle class families have experienced not just this past year, but over the past several uh, decades. From 1979 to 2008, real median family income grew at an annual rate of 0.4% a year, while productivity growth grew by 2% a year. Middle class families are not keeping pace. One of the results is that those at the top, the families in the top 1% of the income distribution, accounted for 23% of total income in 2007, the highest level of income concentration since 1928. Family incomes are not rising, yet in more and more families, both husband and wife are working. Female labor force participation rates have risen significantly, reaching almost 60% in 2007, relative to roughly 40% in the 1960s. And between 1979 and 2006, working wives and middle income families worked an average of 500 hours a year more, that's roughly three months a year more than previously. At the same time, healthcare costs and tuition uh, costs are rising rapidly, putting increased pressure on middle class families. A strong America must be built on a strong middle class, which is why the work of this task force is so important and why we included in this year's budget some key initiatives developed by the task force. A child care tax credit, help for families caring for elderly and disabled relatives, loan forgiveness for college students, and ways to promote retirement savings. One reason that the Middle Class Task Force has been so effective in developing these and other proposals is the man leading it. It's my distinct honor to introduce a champion in the middle class, someone I think a lot of us call a friend, the Vice President of the United States, Joe Biden. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. And I realize there's a number of leaders in the audience who, uh, by their leadership of union movements, by their leadership of uh, a whole range of organizations that are out here, are the champions in the middle class. Um, you know, uh, folks, uh, this is a bit unusual. Uh, the President of the United States, the first official announcement, I think was the first official announcement he made, other than after personnel were named for the Cabinet and the administration, very, very early on, was that uh, um, he was going to set up this thing called the Middle Class Task Force. Uh, and, uh, and I think when it happened, a lot of people wondered, well, okay, that, is, this, is this sort of a, you know, a gimmick? Administrations come along and set up special envoys and special task force and special focus. Um, but the truth of the matter is, Barack and I, the President and I, met when we said during the campaign that we'll ultimately measure the success of our efforts as President and Vice President at the end of the day, not merely on whether or not the GDP is growing at two, four, six, eight, whatever percentage it may grow, and it's going to grow closer to uh, four to six, hopefully, before the time we're finished. But the fact of the matter is that uh, that's not enough. The question that we're going to determine whether we, we succeed or not, our judgment about ourselves, is whether or not middle-class folks sitting around their kitchen tables after we've been out of office actually look at one another and feel more secure of uh, being able to stay at that table in that neighborhood, be able to send their kid to school, be able to have a living standard that they work so hard to get, and have a sense that those aspiring to the middle class will make it and their kids will be able to do at least as well, if not better, than they were able to do. You know, the goal was clear. It was to ensure that when we move from recession to recovery, and we are moving from recession to recovery, we have 
made significant strides because of the, the women and men arrayed behind me, alongside me here, the, the, the economic team here. We've made great progress. But the truth of the matter is, uh, unless middle class folks end up coming out of this recession, better off than they went into the recession, then we really haven't done our job. To help working Americans get by during these times, uh, to get ahead, to improve their living standard, is what this is all about. And as a consequence of this, and people ask me all the time, how does this thing work, this middle class task force? Well, every administration, Democrat and Republican, is concerned about middle class tax force, uh, middle class folks. It's not like, I'm not suggesting this is a particularly partisan thing. The fact is, though, that what happens is most administrations get consumed from the moment they take office, not just ours, with urgent, urgent requirements that must be attended to. And what happens is each of the department heads finds themselves in a position where they're responding to the most urgent need the nation faces that falls into their, their jurisdiction. And what happens is the things that are important that actually can impact on the living standard and, if you will, the sense of security middle class people have, uh, somehow gets uh, their, they become secondary. The difference in this was the middle class task force was set up. I call regular meetings. Every cabinet head comes, as well as the leading members of the economic team. And I have been a pain in the neck, along with the team behind me, of saying to all the cabinet members, make sure you've got someone in your department who every morning when they get up, they put both feet in the floor, they're thinking, what within my jurisdiction am I able to do to alleviate the pain the middle class folks are going through now and enhance the prospects for middle class families? You just heard from the Assistant Secretary of Labor. That's exactly what this is about. All the things that are going on, yet they went back and focused on. They focused on something that is not one of these headline issues that people out, you know, uh, will say, well, this is a big issue. Guess what, though? A lot of folks are not getting the best treatment, the best advice, and the most help in figuring out how to deal with their retirement plans. It's a big deal. It's a big deal. It will impact upon, will impact upon, one piece will impact upon the way in which families planning for their retirement are able to have a better prospect of their retirement benefits being enhanced and not diminished. Because the President and I have long held that you can't build a strong economy uh, without a strong middle class, um, it's, uh, that becomes the bedrock of what we're trying to do here. Right now, the middle class in this country is nowhere near as strong as it needs to be. So the folks uh, on the task force uh, um, that we've, uh, we've had have been traveling across the country. All the people behind me here have traveled around. The, we've been in the 60-some cities on the Recovery Act as well as the Middle Class Task Force um, initiatives. And we're hearing directly from people out in their communities about the challenges they face, the ideas they have that are going to make it better uh, for them in their homes. Whether we're talking clean energy uh, in, uh, in St. Cloud or green jobs in Denver or manufacturing in uh, at Perrysburg, Ohio or college affordability in St. Louis, uh, uh, nothing has been more valuable than going out and literally talking to Americans. And guess what? They're showing up. They're showing up. They want to be heard. My dad used to have an expression. He used to say, I don't expect the government to solve all my problems but I sure expect them to understand my problems. And the first part of this is being an administration that understands their anxieties, understands their problems. And so we've identified a number of specific, uh, specific proposals 
and policies that are going to begin to ease the strain on working class families. This morning, after a year's work, we're releasing the first annual report, which I thought I had here, but I hope you have copies of it. The first annual report of the task force, uh, which uh, brings together all of the work that we've done and tells the stories of uh, middle class families we've spoken to and how we're going to move toward uh, improving their living standards. Look, these are the realities. There is a gap, a growing gap, between productivity and the middle class incomes, a rise in economic inequity that continues, and an ever-mounting challenge of balancing work and uh, family responsibilities. Uh, just ask any woman in this crowd, um, and a whole lot of men as well. Men and women across the country are sitting across their kitchen tables, they were this morning, uh, trying to uh, hide their worries uh, from their children, uh, worries about how they're going to maintain their lifestyle, how they're going to be able to send the kids back to college. Is Mary, we going to have enough to send Mary back to college next semester? Uh, how they're going to take care of, uh, you know, mom is really ill. And uh, I don't know, do we, does she move in with us? Or what do we do when we're both working? And how do we get her to the doctor? And I mean, th th these are the things that people in my own neighborhoods talk about. These are the things the vast majority of the American people talk about. And so this report doesn't just tick off the problems. It offers some very, uh, very specific solutions. Uh, it proposes specific initiatives aimed at addressing uh, these quality of life issues facing middle class families and families everywhere. And the solutions we laid out were uh, all of the one I'm going to mention today and others that are in the report. Most of them were in the President's State of the Union message, and they're contained in our proposed budget. To quote my dad twice, uh, my dad used to have to have a saying. He'd say, don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget, and I'll tell you what you value. Don't tell me what you value. Show me your budget. What are you spending money on? And then I'll tell you what you value. It's a pretty transparent way of figuring out what somebody values. Well, in the White House budget, we laid out for you uh, what we value. We think it's important to double the child tax care credit for middle class families with incomes up to $85,000 and increasing the credit for nearly every family, making other under $115,000. How many of you yourselves or how many of you know people that the bulk of the second income in the household is eaten up by making sure you have quality daycare or quality care for your child. That's a big deal. Provide more resources for child care and development fund, money that means uh, 235,000 kids will get quality care and their parents will get peace of mind. Giving additional funding so families who are caring for elderly parents can, uh, can give them help, like, uh, like uh, home health care aids, respite care, preparing meals. Look, one of the hardest things, think about it, Again, I, they, everybody kids me. Am I always saying we should just talk English to the American people? You know, and my my uh, neighbor who was an old Italian lady said, "Joe, speak English." <laughs> well, you know, well, what what is it? What what are the problems people face? You're both working, and your 87 year old mother has to get to the doctor. How she get to the doctor? She's not driving anymore. I mean, there, so this family respite. We're going to give money to states who have these programs to fund these kinds of everything from transportation to senior centers, the things that make a difference in the quality of life for people. We're also ensuring that those students who have had to borrow money, which is almost everybody I know, uh, through a federal loan program, or in this case, federal loan program, never have to pay back more than 10 percent of what they're earning, as long as they're paying that back never have to pay, pay back more than 10 percent of what they're earning in any uh, paycheck, in any, you know, of their total income. Otherwise, what we do is we make them make god-awful choices, as, as the President says, you know, you shouldn't have to, in order to go to college, pay these, I'm paraphrasing, pay these exorbitant long-term uh, costs for a college education. We're offering more workers better access to retirement plans. 
by making sure that employers enroll you in a retirement plan unless you choose to opt out so middle class American can save money and save it confidently so you don't have to. If you have, all the studies these guys have shown me, there is if you have an automatic mechanism in place and automatically is taken out and is put in your own IRA, whether or not it's a defined benefit plan, just to save. People do it. People do it. If they don't want to do it, they don't have to. But every employer uh, is going to have to, the vast majority of employers are going to have to provide this, this for, this, this, this service for their employees. We're for simplifying and expanding what is called the saver's credit. Uh, where if a middle class worker wants to put a thousand, up to a thousand bucks in a retirement account, um, they will get it matched up to 50 percent. And it can, if it's a hundred dollars, it's fifty dollars. But up to a hundred percent. We need to put people into positions, the secretary said, so that they have some confidence and capacity to have a retirement where they're not dependent, where they're able to live a decent life. We're for enhancing labor, the Labor Department's ability to make sure workers are protected by overtime rules that are uh, uh, so that uh, employees are accu the accurately classified uh, instead of in, uh, as regular work instead of independent contractors so hardworking Americans get paid for what they actually do, for what they actually do. And as we step forward, uh, you know, making the retirement system uh, safer, as you've heard today uh, from the Secretary, so that uh, um, the uh, Labor Department says, and now what sounds like dry regulations, those dry regulations can make a whole lot of difference between whether or not someone has something to retire on that is consistent with the effort they put in and the investments they made. Look, folks, uh, um, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot more we're looking at. Together, these initiatives, though, are really an important first step uh, uh, toward delivering on the promise we made uh, a long time ago to make sure that middle class, the middle class, emerges from this recession into the recovery better off than they were before they went in. As is referenced by, uh, by Peter, um, you know, from 2000 to 2007, productivity grew by 20 percent, and yet middle class folks actually lost earning power during that period. It used to be a bargain back in the 30s and 40s and 50s. You know, your productivity goes up, those who help produce it get a chunk of it. Well, we, we know, though, that the most important thing we can do, the most important thing we can do to maintain people's ability to get to and stay in the middle class is a good paying job. That is the single most important thing. And the President is working day and night. It is almost the single focus of this administration. Now that we have uh, saved ourselves from the brink, brought, been brought back from the brink, that's all we're doing. But not just creating any jobs, creating good, decent paying jobs that people are going to be able to live a middle class life on. So don't, uh, don't take my word for it, though. Uh, um, if you take a look at the proposals that we've come up with in this task force, um, there are a lot of people who think these are important steps. <laughs> we've heard from, and you will hear from, dozens of leading experts and advocates, many of whom are here today, who support these proposals and believe that they are an effective way to ease the burden uh, that middle-class families are, uh, are shouldering now and in the future. And ultimately, to determine if these proposals make any sense, as I said, you ought to go out and listen to the stories that we've all heard from hardworking Americans. You know, it's getting to be very much sort of a, a way of expressing views here to quote, you know, stories and letters. But the truth of the matter is, they're usually the best way to communicate uh, what, uh, what we're hearing. You know, in, in St. Louis, uh, I listened to a mother who told me her daughter was trying to reconcile her excitement over a new job as a teacher with being able to afford uh, the sky-high payments of, on her $60,000 student loan. You know, in, uh, listen to Shannon, a single woman and a veteran uh, in Pennsylvania who is balancing caring for her kids, working full-time, who wrote to tell me that her paycheck would barely cover uh, her bills and she doesn't know what she's going to do to get by in terms of the child care that she has to provide. Look, the task force is, again, designed to deal with real-world, real-life problems and dilemma that middle-class people who are under an extreme pressure now to be help them better deal with their circumstances. 
Um, and uh, we've done a lot so far and a lot more to do. But one of the things that I'm really disappointed in this morning, quite frankly, is that uh, right now a single Republican senator is standing up in the chamber I worked in for a long, long time, and he is filibustering the extension of a number of things we had in the Recovery Act to begin with, which make a fundamental difference in the near-term uh, concern of middle-class people. He's blocking the extension of, uh, of uh, uh, unemployment insurance, which means if he succeeds, one million people, one million people next month will be thrown off the unemployment rolls. One million people will be thrown into with nothing but what I would call despair. A lot of you have had family members. I, I, don't, I don't know that. But my, I suspect some of you have had family members who face that, that dilemma of knowing that they have no income, they have no job, no immediate prospects, and there's no help out there. I wish, uh, I wish that senator would think about how, uh, how that man or woman uh, is going to explain uh, to their kids uh, how they're going to get by uh, the next three, four, five, six, seven months. Um, people are going to start to lose their health care they get through the COBRA subsidies uh, created by the Recovery Act. Listeners don't, not everyone knows what COBRA is. It's a way to keep your health insurance. We're subsidizing those who lost their job. They'll be able to keep their health insurance by us giving them a little help. You know, you sit there and you worry about you don't have health care. You won't have health care if you lose it. You lose this. You, you're not allowed, allowed to be in the plan you're in before. And then what happens? You've got a pre-existing condition. You're out. You have no insurance. You go on for a while, and then you go try to get it again. This is real stuff, man. This affects real people right now. Right now. Also, there, uh, the proposal that he's blocking uh, uh, means small business are going to lose access to credit, no fees, and up to 85 percent the SBA. I mean, these, these, these affect people right now on Main Street. All doctors across the country who are now uh, taking care of Medicare patients and TRICARE patients, uh, they're, they're going to see their pay cut, 21 percent. And uh, lest you say, well, I don't feel so badly for doctors, first of all, this will be unfair. But even if you don't care a whole lot for doctors, guess what? Eventually, what's going to happen if that doesn't get restored, you're going to find them not seeing Medicare patients. You're going to find access for the elderly being narrowed, closed, or blocked because the docs don't want to do it anymore or can't financially afford to do it anymore. So, uh, folks, uh, these, they, these are critical things that we acted on, we did, in place, that gave relief and continue to give relief. What we talked about today are the things, the additional things we're going to do right now while we're creating jobs and even after we've created more jobs. But in the meantime, the irony is here, while we're making progress on the task force, because of the recalcitrance of a single senator in the United States Senate, uh, a lot of middle class people, if we don't succeed, I believe we will, but if we don't succeed in overcoming that objection, there's going to be an immediate hurt, immediate hurt on a lot of people very quickly. So, folks, uh, yesterday I thought the President and the Republicans and the Democrats in Congress were acted in a way that I'm used to things having, act, having been done for a long, long time here. Whether we end up ultimately agreeing or not, it was civil. There was a real live discussion. People really aired their differences. And my hope is that we get back to that time and day, and what's going on on the Hill now is not a reflection of that. But we are not going to yield, the President and I, this team, until, in fact, we keep the commitment that we made when we ran. We're going to improve the living standards of Americans. We're going to improve the living standard of middle class uh, Americans. We're going to see to those striving to get in are able to get in, and those there are going to stay. That's the work of the middle class task force. And I can't thank uh, the folks arrayed to my right and left enough for the, the not, not only their, their, their work on this and helping with all the other things they're doing but the enthusiasm with which they've embraced this project. So thank you all very much. And uh, as my grandpa would say, keep the faith. We're going to get this done. Okay? Thank you all very much.